So to begin with, my name is Derek Skies. I am the representative of House District 4, which is in Whitefish, which is of course in the most incredible, beautiful place of this state, Flathead Valley. All right, to begin with, I wanna talk about the principles of 98. In the legislative session, I learned that there's a word that scares Montanans, and that word is nullification. And so I'm not supposed to use that word because I don't want to scare people. And it's unfortunate that our press, which is something that John Birch Society knows infinitely well, is great at steering public opinion through ignorance. And so I'm not going to use that word. So I dug a little deeper. The word I want to use is the principles of 98. Because once those principles were established, that's what everybody used in, as an argument to support it. They said, well, we believe in the principles of 98, therefore. Or we think that we agree with Madison and Jefferson and we agree with the 98 principles. And so I'm going to refer to this entirely in that way. First, before we begin any kind of presentation, I need to, I need to sway your opinion. I need to bring you around, although I think a lot of you are probably similar in mindset to me, so it probably won't be that difficult. But there's some basic assumptions that we need to have. The first assumption is that the Supreme Court is fallible. If anybody in this room thinks that the Supreme Court is infallible, you might not want to listen to the rest of the presentation. <laughs> I think the very first thing they did wrong was Marbury v. Madison. Because judicial review is not a given power. Another one is uh, Dred Scott v. Sanford. I don't know if you guys know that one. Dred Scott v. Sanford was when the Supreme Court said that they called them Negroes at the time, but we call them African Americans today. They will never have the right of citizenship and a whole host of other things which, is, which has been rectified by the 14th Amendment. And I might add, for the Frankie Wilmers of the world, that was established law during their day. <laughs> Another lawsuit that I really, really do not like, and it's a little closer to home, in 1958, Cooper v. Aaron. Does anybody know that one? Had a lot of liberals beat me up on that one. Cooper v. Aaron says, and, and it's funny, whenever the Supreme Court usurps a power, they always say it's a landmark decision. Don't you love that? You know, Marbury, Marbury v. Madison, that was a landmark decision. Yeah, it was. Cooper v. Aaron was the decision of the Supreme Court of the United States was held that the states were bound by the court's decisions and could not choose to ignore them. And so whenever I would say something like, well, I don't think that's right, then they would throw out, ooh, what about Cooper v. Aaron? And so right there, I think I've proven this point. My second point is the federal government constantly seeks to expand its own power. And it can only do this by usurping power of us in the state or us as individuals. Once again, this is an axiom. I, I think I don't need to convince anybody in the room of this. And, and we can easily find this in our Constitution and its interpretation currently through the Commerce Clause, the Welfare Clause, or the Supremacy Clause. All of those have been horribly misinterpreted by the federal government in order for the federal government to gain our power from us. Last but not least on my assumptions is all great republics in history have fallen to some form of tyrannical oligarchy. Every single one. Rome had its Caesar. Athens had its 411 when they voted in tyrants. The city-states of, of Italy. Every single great republic goes through a prescripted series of events and ends up most likely in a tyranny. Now, that having been said, I see people, oh my gosh, Derek, you're a doom and gloomer. I think America is an exceptional exception to that rule. And that's why we're all here to fight that. Before I dive into the rest of the assumptions, I just want to say, I don't know if anybody listens to the Voices of Montana, and if you don't, you should. It's a really good radio station. Uh, the, the, the individuals behind that show are definitely in our camp. There's a young man named Thomas Woods, Dr. Thomas Woods. He's a professor. Has anybody read this book? Oh, this book is awesome. There's only two left outside, so if two people get up and sneak out real quick, I understand exactly why you're doing that. <laughs> this book is called Nullification, How to Resist Federal Tyranny in the 21st Century. And since I like Dr. Woods so much, I'm going to set that right there. What he does is he sets a case for nullification, and that's basically what I'm doing, but I don't want to use the N-word. And I was quoting him, by the way. But he gives 11 federal documents that prove nullification beyond a point of fact. And so it's, it's a phenomenal tool. So at the end of this, if you want to go home and do some homework, that's where you should go. All right, let's look at some uh, historical support. This is where I differ from some of the other individuals that, su that support nullification, is I'm tying it to what we call the Lesser Magistrate Doctrine. Has anybody heard of this? It was pushed originally by some Calvinists, and one of them was the guy that's quoted there, John Knox, and he wrote an appellation written to the uh, nobles of Scotland in 1558. Basically, the Lesser Magistrate appeal is, 
Now, a lesser magistrate versus a greater magistrate. Let's explain that. Montana is a lesser magistrate. The federal government is a greater magistrate. So that's the, the, the scheme there. Montana is a greater magistrate. We are a lesser magistrate. Or actually, there would be probably counties and then municipalities and then us. So you understand the hierarchies of lesser to greater magistrates. And so what they said what is it was it was the duty of a lesser magistrate when something happened or a law occurred or an edict came down from the greater magistrate that was onerous or against the law or against common law or against the Constitution. And therefore, the majority of the lesser magistrates knew that something was wrong with this, but they didn't legally have the right to tell the greater magistrate that's wrong. Now, there's usually a course of a prescriptive course, but sometimes that doesn't happen when the greater magistrate really doesn't care what you think. And so let's read this quote. He, he was, uh, what happened to him was he, he was, uh, it, it was in the Reformation, and so there was a battle between the, the Protestants and the Catholics, and the Catholics burned him in effigy, and he was afraid they were going to kill him. So he appealed to the lords, uh, the Scottish lords, and he said, You are bound to correct and repress whatsoever you know of him, the higher magistrate, to attempt expressly repugning to God's word, honor, glory, or what you shall aspire him to do against this subject's great or small. In other words, it's God that says that we are his children, and therefore we need protection from something that's done on high, and that's the moral basis for it. You won't find this in a Supreme Court document. The very first document that really showed this lesser magistrate was the Magna Carta. And I know you hardcore history folks will say, no, Derek, that was June 15th. That was actually when they put together the articles and they finally got John to sign on the 19th. So I used the 19th. For those of us that don't know, and I understand why, because a lot of us went to public school, the, the Magna Carta was a document that no, many barons, they forced John to sign. Now, John was the king of England and he was putting down a tax to support a whole series of wars he was going to go fight and try and get his, get his birthright back in France. The baron said, we are taxed enough. Isn't it funny how the history repeats itself? The baron said, we're taxed enough. And, and so they gathered up their forces and they forced John to sign this document. Now, what's important about this document is it gave free men rights. And it was neat because they argued it, it didn't give it to the nobles. They used the word freemen. Now, unfortunately, back in the day, there was a small percentage of folks that were actually freemen. But the fact that it used the word freeman and then, it, and then it, it articulated the rights that we are guaranteed as freemen to have by our creator, that was the basis for English common law that, that gave us rights given to us by our creator. So the Magna Carta is an incredible document. And I bet you did know it was also a, an appeal of the lesser magistrate to the greater magistrate. Let's continue on down through time. We get into King, Queen Elizabeth's reign. This is the 16th century. And there was a guy, his name was Sir Edward Coke. Like it says here, he was the Attorney General for the Queen and he was also the Chief Justice under the reign of James, the, her successor. He used the Magna Carta as a weapon against the oppressive, oppressive tactics of the Stuart Kings. Now the reason he's important is because up until this point, it had been what, two, three hundred years and it had become obscure. It hasn't really been referenced. Every king didn't want it to be <laughs> remembered. And so as time went by, the, the Magna Carta kind of faded in, in importance. So Sir Edward Coke brought it back up. Now the beautiful thing about that is him bringing it back up made the colonists learn about it. Because the colonists had a whole different setup when they came to America. They were separate from the old Europe. And they were allowed to do a lot of self-governance. And so in finding out how to govern self, they researched ways to do that. And they referred to the Magna Carta. And, and in finding out the Magna Carta, they quoted uh, Sir Edward Ho Coke, excuse me. Let's go to another document that is an appeal of the lesser magistrate to the greater magistrate. Does, does anybody know this one? Heard about it. <laughs> this one was the last straw document. How many times did we try to get King George to do what we wanted before this document? I mean, Ben Franklin was there as an agent of multiple colonies. They were trying to get the king to ease Parliament's taxation of the colony to pay for the Seven Years' War. And they had no real authority to do it because they had no representation in Parliament to achieve it. So therefore, all they could do was appeal to the greater magistrate. And so after appeal, after appeal, after appeal, they finally said, well, guess what? We'll go to a declaration. And so this is the final straw in appeals from a lesser to a greater magistrate. Now we come to another stage in the principles of 98 argument. 
What I've drawn a conclusion to for us is to show where the appeal of the lesser to the greater magistrate shows that we have a voice that is stronger than the voice that's theoretically above us. And that is the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions of 1798. There are two different positions. Jefferson basically used the N-word, nullification. He said that an individual state had the authority, <laughs> had the authority to say a law was unconstitutional. That was pretty aggressive. And, and a lot of writers from that point on have said that's kind of dangerous because if just one state could do it legally, according to the Supreme Court, according to the Constitution, that would lead to anarchy. So Madison, who was a, a wise man as well, he asserted that states are duty bound to interpose. So he coined a phrase called interposition. So we have the N word and then we have the I word, interposition. He said uh, a deliberate, palpable, and dangerous, unconstitutional action by the federal government. That's what Madison said. So if we study what interposition really means, interposition, what Madison said was, one state doesn't have the authority because one state didn't sign the Constitution. All colonies signed the Constitution. So therefore, all states are signatories to the Constitution. So one doesn't have the authority, but a bunch do. And so that's what interposition was. And that is, and this was his Virginia resolution. The resolution derives the asserted right of interposing for arresting the progress of usurpations by the federal government from the fact that its powers were limited to the grant made by the states, a grant certainly not made by a single party to the grant, but by the parties to the compact containing that grant. The mode of their interposition in an extraordinary cases is left by the resolution to the parties themselves, as the mode of interposition lies with the parties to other constitutions in the event of usurpations of power not remitable under the forms and by the means provided by the Constitution. So a long word short is he's saying, okay, how do you fix the Constitution if you don't like it? You amend it, right? We have a process for that. That's, how, that's the, really the only way the Constitution is a living, breathing document is through the amendment process. But if we have a judiciary who's complicit with a legislature, who's complicit with an executive branch, and all three of them together are interpreting the Constitution incorrectly, where does that leave us? How are we ever going to get that fixed? Exactly. Nullification, interposition. And what they suggested was, we all, we all know with the schoolhouse rock, you know, you have the, 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 the levels of federal government and they all, inter, they all check each other and they all balance each other. And the, picture them on a horizontal plane. And they, and they balance each other horizontally. Madison and Jefferson said there was a vertical check and balance as well, and that was the check brought by us to the states through the lesser magistrate doctrine. So if we thought it was unconstitutional, that was an angle that we could use to tell the federal government, no, nope, what you're doing is wrong. And then, according to Madison, if we got enough states to realize it, then we could make it happen. We could actually stop it. We could actually interpret constitutionality of law as citizens of the individual republic. And that is the Kentucky and Virginia resolutions. Well, let's talk about applications of the principles of 98. Actually, right before the tariff of abominations in 1828, Jefferson was president and he was having conflicts with the French and the British, and the French and the British were in a war. And this was in the early 1800s. And so they were pillaging and destroying American shipping. And so he thought, I think poorly, poor guy, because I love Jefferson, that what we need to do is embargo ourselves. We can't ship to anybody in, in, in the world. And so it shut down shipping in America. That led to a huge problem. That's actually the first use of the principles of 98 was all the states that fought that. And so I, I should have inserted that in here, but it's relevant. And if you research it, Massachusetts began it, Connecticut jumped in there, Rhode Island jumped in there, and eventually a bunch of people jumped in there. What solved it was the War of 1812, as so many things constitutionally are solved, unfortunately, in that the peace of 1812 stopped the conflict. And so that isn't really a successful interposition of the events because it was solved by peace. But let's get to the tariff of abominations of 1828. This one is, was where the issues, the issue of the principles of 98 were most referenced by our founding fathers, by the individuals of the day. Long story short, the South relied on, their mar on the world market to sell their agricultural goods. And the North had, was dominating Congress. And so they passed this really tough set of tariffs in 1828 and in 1832. And they were designed to make it difficult for, the, for foreign countries to sell their goods to us. So what that did was it protected the northern manufacturing, but it didn't protect the southern agriculture. So the southern ag guys were still stuck at trying to deal with countries that were being hammered by us on the other side. And so the south, a lot of the states in the south felt justly that they were being, it, what was done to them was incorrect. And so that's what started all this. 
Well, at the time, John C. Calhoun was the vice president of uh, Jackson. John C. Calhoun resigned as vice president, went and got a seat in the Senate, and from that position started a interposition battle. He wrote an incredible document, and I see some folks are taking notes. He wrote this in 1828. It's the South Carolina Exposition in Protest, a very eloquent appeal as to why interposition and nullification is a possibility for states to use. And he suggested that they use this. So he started a big confrontation. And it's funny, if there was some opposition in the room, you guys would be saying, well, Derek, what about South Carolina? They used nullification to secede. That's not true. And in fact, previous to the Civil War, the North used nullification more against the Fugitive Slave Act than the South ever did. But that's another story. And so South Carolina basically said, we're not going to adhere to these tariffs. So then in 1833, President Jackson passed an act called the Force Act. And in the Force Act, he had the right to use troops against us. See, back then, posse comitatus was still in effect, so they couldn't use our troops against us. So luckily, the crisis was averted because right at the very end, there was a compromise that was reached. And there must be an opponent in the room. Do you guys hear that? So the, the crisis was averted due to a compromise. And it was at the last moment. And so the compromise was that they would phase out the tariff over the course of 10 years, and South Carolina was happy about it. But as a final smack, South Carolina, of course, nullified the Force Act. <laughs> I love that. Okay, so now let's jump ahead. I've told you guys how we can do it through interposition. I've told you how interposition is justified morally by the lesser magistrate. So now let's look at how applications of the principles in 98 can go on today. And the number one success story is real ID. And if you guys can't see this, the red are states that have passed a statute that have prohibited it entirely, a statute. It's in their books. It will not apply. I don't know about you, but that sounds just like null and void. Yellow are states that have passed a resolution renouncing it or, or saying they don't approve of it or they think it's wrong. Green are anti-real ID legislation that has passed in at least one chamber but has, hasn't made it further. And last is a real ID legislation has yet to be introduced. Or, I'm sorry, has just been introduced and white is none of the above. Woohoo! And so what that has done is the, the Real ID Act is still on the books, which by the way is a really bad law. If you don't think it is, research it. It's a really bad thing. You don't want to give them Real ID. And so this is a classic example of interposition. 28 states have decided, no, that's not constitutional and we're not going to do it in our states. Each individual state nullified it, and together they interposed against the federal government. And what did the federal government do? Does anybody have a real ID in their wallet? No. The federal government backed off. They can't implement it while this many of us fight it. And that's the very basis of what Madison said. We, the people, created the Constitution. And through that Constitution, we control our federal government. And so if the federal government is doing something that we find onerous or that we think is not constitutional. It's our right, it, it's our God-given duty to fight it. It's our right to say no. And that's what I said in the legislature. Now, a lot of folks were kind of upset about that. Well, praise God, there were a lot of guys that said, yeah, Derek, you're exactly right. This is wrong, we need to fight it. And there were guys even further along than me, Creighton Kearns tried to nullify the entire Endangered Species Act. God bless them. <laughs> I know. I, you know what's sad about that little story, sorry I digress, <laughs> is that it was a $2 billion price tag to Montana. $2 billion of federal free money we're not going to get, we can't do that. That's why that was killed, which is tragic in and of itself, but that leads to a whole different series of arguments and I'm not here to discuss that today. Okay, so finally there was a bill, House Bill 382 that was introduced in the legislature. This bill was landmark in that it established, or it wanted to establish, needless to say this thing totally died. So basically what 382 did, this was a, this was a suggestion. This is actually model legislation done by uh, retired General Paul Valley, and he has a group up in Big Fork, and they're working together, and they worked with me, and we, we kind of designed this. Now this had like a template structure, so we just kind of plugged it into the state of Montana. So what 382 basically said was we were going to establish a council. And we suggested 11 people on this council, 11 elected representatives, because representatives are the per people that have the constitutional right to create law. You know, I know the executive branch likes to do it, and so the judicial branch, but we only gave the legislature that ability. And so the bill said, 
What we'll do then is we'll create alliances with states. And so we'll start an 11 man council in Montana. And then what that group will do is we'll intercept laws coming into Montana. Now, there's a million laws coming down the pike to Montana, but we're all smart. There's a handful that are really gonna mess us up. Like cap and tax or cap and trade, if you wanna call it that. That's a horrible bill, it's a horrible idea. And it's dying on the floor of the Congress, but it's being implemented right now according to administrative rule. You're gonna be under that law. And it's not, it's not a law done by the federal government. It's not a law created by the legislature. What it does is it creates an 11-man function, and those guys are designed to take a look at laws coming down. Like My original idea was to get, go after that cap and tax. So we see that law coming, so we're saying, okay, how is this gonna affect Montana? Let's get the PSC, let's take a look at it, let's analyze it, these 11 folks. If we determine that that law is gonna damage Montana or, or hurt our ability to have income or, or damage our schools or do anything wrong that would hurt Montana citizens or be contrary to what we think is the Constitution or contrary to what we think Montana's Constitution is, then we're gonna recommend to the legislature that we nullify it. And so that was what we proposed. And, and it would work because it's nullification according to Jefferson and it's interposition according to Madison. Because then once we decide, you know, hey, really, or um, I'm sorry, the cap and tax is wrong, then I'm gonna call my buddies over in Idaho. Hey, you guys got your committee going? Yeah, would you guys look at this law? Oh my gosh, that's horrible, great. I call my buddy over in North Dakota, <laughs> South Dakota, Wyoming, Utah. What happens? Real ID, it dies. That's how this is successful. And so, so many folks, when they, we were over there, they were fighting as hardcore on every angle they could to make this fringe, kook, unconstitutional, unsupportable. It puts us on the fringe. It leads to sedition. It leads to secession. All those things are incorrect. And in all honesty, because they had to go through that many courses to prove it bad, <laughs> I'm like, man, I am totally behind it. And so, it, when I go to push this bill again, now you guys know what this bill is going to do. And I'm gonna make sure that as many states around us has a copy of this bill. Because then us together can use interposition to leverage back the Fed. I've often said, some folks have been generous enough to think I'm a decent person and they said, Derek, why don't you run for the state? And I said, man, I do not want to go to Washington, D.C. I, I pray that God does not direct me in that direction because that's, that's tough work. I would much rather save Montana. Montana has more authority, really, than Denny or the two senators. Because we're signatories to the Constitution. We created the document. I know we weren't one of the 13 colonies, but by extension, we're the signatories of the Constitution. And so let's use the power of Montana to leverage the federal government to do what we know it should do. And so that's where interposition comes to today. That's what this book is, is dictating us to do. He does a way more eloquent job than me describing it, Amy. He goes through the, the documents that prove it, and there's thousands of documents that prove it. And, and, and it has been lost to us due to the status due to the poor education system and due to a, just a general lack of knowledge and apathy in our electorate. And so with that, I, I thank you so much for your time. I love leaving it open to questions. So I didn't want to dominate too much time. I wanted to leave it open to questions. So at this point, thank you so much for your attention. I hope you liked what I said. And if you have any questions, I'd love to help.